Good morning and welcome virtually to the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University. I'm Scott Paul. I serve here as the in the center as the interim director and executive director. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, we are thrilled to spend these two days with you considering pressing issues of religious liberty and how these issues may be affected by the new U.S. Supreme Court. If you'll allow me a, a, a few words of introduction and acknowledgement. Uh, organized in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy in our state and national communities in a nonpartisan manner. We pursue this mission in a multidisciplinary fashion to more effectively equip a new generation of citizens and leaders with the broad understanding that, criti that is critical to the perpetuation of constitutional government, ordered liberty, and the rule of law. I hope you're able to enjoy our first session earlier th this morning. If you missed it, uh, check back at the end of the uh, check back next week uh, at uvu.edu slash CCS slash events or on this YouTube channel for recordings of the sessions of this conference. My colleagues and I have been looking forward to this session for a long time. This session was to be the focal point of our 2020 First Amendment Conference because 2020 was the 30 year anniversary of the decision in the US Supreme Court case, Employment Division of Oregon v. Smith. However, uh, the conference scheduled for late March 2020 never happened. This is especially uh, an especially poignant moment for us because the organizer of the 2020 version of this session was our late director, Dr. Rodney Smith. Rod was a champion of the rights of conscience. He often declared that he spent his career trying to understand the meaning of 16 words. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We sometimes comfort ourselves here in the center with the notion that Rod can finally end his scholarly quest by putting his questions directly to James Madison. Oh, how we'd love to be there for that conversation <laughs> and how we miss our beloved leader and dear friend. We are especially mindful of him as we honor him with this session. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of the session. Kim Colby is director of the Christian Legal Society's Center for Law and Religion, Religious Freedom. She was co-counsel in two cases heard by the United States Supreme Court. In both cases, she represented religious students seeking access to either a public high school campus or a public law school campus. She has been co-counsel on dozens of friend of the court briefs filed in the Supreme Court, as well as in uh, lower federal and, and state courts. She testified about religious freedom three times before a subcommittee of the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee, as well as once before the United States Commission on Civil Rights. She received her BA in history, summa cum laude, from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and her JD from Harvard Law School. Kim, thank you for joining us today. It's really my pleasure, Scott. I'm just it is a pleasure to be here, and it's also just wonderful to be a small part of honoring the legacy of Rodney Smith. He really was a voice that advanced religious freedom for so many years. Um, I also have the honor of moderating an outstanding panel on a critical case for all Americans' religious freedom, Employment Division versus Smith. As the title of the panel indicates, Smith was decided 31 years ago. Uh, April 17th, 1990, and it's being revisited by the United States Supreme Court even now in a case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia that we'll hear more about later. We should learn the court's decision in the Fulton case by late June of this summer and find out whether the court has decided to overrule Smith, uh, greatly narrow it, or whether Smith, Smith will remain the law of the land. We all have moments that stand out in our memories, and I distinctly remember where I was in my house uh, when I got a call on April 17th, 1990, from a friend and colleague. Uh, he's now Professor Mike Paulson at St. Thomas University School of Law, but we worked together at CLS at the time, and Mike called 
And he was, he was a little bit in a panic. He said, Kim, the court has just issued a horrible decision for religious freedom. It's a disaster. Well, I tried to reassure him by saying, hey, we knew we were probably going to lose that case that involved drugs. It's really not a big deal. But then he said, no, they've overturned the test for free exercise claims. Any law now trumps religious freedom. And he was right. Or was he? That's what we'll be discussing on this panel as we go forward. So we have three panelists and I'm gonna introduce them all now. So we can just go from one to the other as we proceed. Our first panelist is Professor Bill Marshall. Professor, Professor Marshall is the William R. Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law in beautiful Chapel Hill, North Carolina. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania and receiving his law degree at the University of Chicago, Bill's pursued a career that has taken him in and out of state and federal government and academia. He was deputy counsel to the president and special assistant to the president during the Clinton administration. And he served as Solicitor General for Ohio, as well as teaching at various leading law schools. He writes extensively, not only on religious freedom, but also a myriad of constitutional issues. And he was one of the first out with a law review article defending the Smith decision many years ago. After Bill, we'll hear from Alexander Dushku, a Salt Lake City lawyer who practices in the firm of Curtin McConkie, where he is a member of the firm's First Amendment and Religious Organizations section, as well as the litigation and appellate sections. Alexander graduated summa cum laude from Brigham Young University and then from BYU's J. Reuben Clark Law School magna cum laude. He clerked for Judge Mannion on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. I've had the honor of working with Alexander fairly frequently on religious freedom matters, particularly amicus briefs in the United States Supreme Court. He is without a doubt one of the finest attorneys I've had the privilege to work with. And I've told people on more than one occasion that if I were ever being deposed and found out that Alexander was the attorney who would be questioning me, I would settle the case on the spot. He's, he's pretty fearsome when he starts asking questions. Our third panelist is Adele Kine, who's been legal counsel with Beckett Law for the past nine years. While at Beckett, Adele has defended the rights of rock bands, Native American sacred dancers, organizations supporting Cuban orphanages, and those pesky nuns, the Little Sisters of the Poor, who keep going up to the Supreme Court and winning, thanks in part to Adele's legal skills. Adele received an AB in politics, magna cum laude from Princeton University, and her law degree with honors from Notre Dame Law School. She clerked for Judge Clement on the Fifth Circuit, and then was an associate in appellate practice at Winston and Strawn in DC, before she joined Beckett, where she has done truly wonderful work on behalf of religious freedom. So before uh, Professor Marshall begins with his remarks, I was asked to uh, briefly describe, just give the background, the facts and, and sort of a little bit of the context for the Smith case. Employment Division versus Smith is truly a landmark decision. It, it governs how courts and government officials apply the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Now the free exercise clause and the establishment clauses of the First Amendment, they're part of the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. They're very short, 16 words, and I'm reading them now. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But what do those words mean? And how are judges to actually apply specific free exercise cases? Over the years, the Supreme Court has used different tests for deciding whether government officials, whether at the federal, state, or local levels, have violated the free exercise rights of a religious person, a religious organization, or a religious congregation. For at least 30 years before Smith, so 1960 to 1990, a liberal Supreme Court, the Warren Court, 
had used what we call a compelling interest test to decide when the free exercise clause had been violated by a government's actions. That test basically asks whether a religious person has sincerely held religious beliefs that have been burdened in some way by the government. If so, the court requires the government to show that it has a compelling interest, a really important reason why it should be allowed to burden a person's free exercise of religion. But the Supreme Court decision in Smith threw out that test, although it left a few things standing, and replaced it with a much weaker test that basically allows the government to override any American's free exercise of religion. The specific facts in Smith involved two men who lived in Oregon and they were employed as drug counselors at a private drug rehab place. They were supposed to help people with their substance abuse problems. Not surprisingly, one of their workplace rules was that they could not use drugs either, of course, on the job or outside of their work. But the two men were members of the Native American church. And one of the sacraments for that church is for its adherence to ingest peyote during its services to experience what they consider to be a spiritual experience through its um, hallucinatory pro properties. Peyote at the time was an illegal drug in Oregon and it, even when it was used for religious purposes. And that was kind of an important fact in the Smith case. Well, when the employers found out that the two men had used the drugs off, off their job as part of their religious uh, commitments, they were fired. So they applied for unemployment benefits from the state, the Oregon Employment Division, and they were denied because the state said, well, you were fired uh, for good cause. You, you were misconduct, you had disobeyed your workplace rule regarding the use of drugs. Interestingly, uh, between 1960 and 1990, the Supreme Court had decided three cases involving people who had been fired from their jobs because they had put their religious beliefs and conduct above a workplace rule. So someone who hadn't shown up for work because it was her Sabbath, uh, someone who refused to help make tanks because of his pacifist beliefs. And in all three cases, the court had said that the free exercise clause would be violated by denying these people their unemployment benefits. But in Smith, the court ruled the opposite. It ruled that the government could deny them unemployment benefits because peyote was an illegal drug. Now that ruling by itself would not be that shocking because it was the 1990s, the drug, the war on drugs was, was you know, prevalent and that would generally have been seen as a compelling interest. So people kind of expected the counselors to lose in the Supreme Court under a compelling interest test, but that's not the test the court applied. It threw out the compelling interest test for free exercise cases. Instead, the court said, that if a law was neutral toward religion, it wasn't passed in order to target religious people or religious practices. And if it applied to everyone, then it applied to religious people, no exceptions. The law trumped the free exercise of religion. The religious individual or institution had to obey the law rather than the religious conscience. That was Smith's basic rule. In order to explain why many of the court's previous decisions uh, still might be good law, it created some exceptions to that rule, which I think we'll hear about from the panel. But the basic rule of Smith is that a religious person or organization must comply with any neutral, generally applicable law, no matter how much the law burdens their religious freedom, no matter how trivial the government's interest in enforcing the law might be, or how easy it would be for the government to achieve its interest while still giving religious persons exemptions from the law. You know, clearly I don't think Smith was a good decision, but Professor Marshall is going to tell us why it is. Right before we turn to Professor Marshall and Bill, we're about to, to turn to you. Um, I just need to make an announcement that the presentations will be followed by a question and answer session we invite our viewers to submit questions via the comment section on this YouTube channel 
or by emailing them to constitution at uvu.edu. That's constitution at uvu.edu. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bill and then Alexander, if you just wanna come in after Bill and Adele after Alexander, uh, that's what we'll do. Thanks very much, Bill. Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. Um, thanks to Scott Paul for all the work you did in putting this together and Carrie Dennis. And mostly thanks to Rod Smith. Um, I have to say a word about Rod myself. Rod is one of the kindest people, was one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. I actually knew Rod at the time the Smith decision came down. We disagreed. I was in a very small minority of, of people who supported that decision, uh, kind of like on this panel now. But Rod, Rod, of course, disagreed, and we had frequent disagreements about it. But Rod loved to disagree, not because he wanted to win arguments, but because he loved the intellectual interchange. He loved ideas. He loved sharing ideas. Uh, and, and those of us who got to know Rod for all those years uh, could see the excitement come into his eyes when there was a discussion take place. And, and I know he would be incredibly excited if, if he were here today. Uh, Rod, we miss you. I miss you. Um, when Smith was decided, very few people supported it. It was, one, it was written by Justice Scalia, one of the most conservative members of the court, and it did exactly what Kim Colby just described that it did. Now, in fact, I'm going to invite Kim in to teach my class the next time because she did such a wonderful job of explaining the decision. It overturned a case called Sherbert versus Werner from 1963, which said, as Kim pointed out, that you needed a compelling state interest in order to justify a restriction on the free exercise. Sherbert itself uh, overturned a decision 100 years earlier called Reynolds versus the United States, which suggested that a neutral law of general applicability, the, the test that, that Justice Scalia adopted, uh, was okay and there was not a right to have a religious exemption from a neutral law. Now, why did Justice Scalia take this position in his own words and he's citing Reynolds on this, he said to hold otherwise would be to make every person a law unto himself. That is, that if you allowed religious beliefs to trump laws then anybody could come along and make any claim and excuse themselves from a particular law and that he found to be alien to what the constitution would require. Now, how might that work? What did it mean to say that, that allowing free exercise exemptions would create, uh, would allow people to create laws unto themselves? Well, let's suppose you wanna bring a free exercise claim. Let's, let's suppose you have a claim, for example, that voter IDs are unconstitutional. They require that you have to have a photograph in order to be able to vote. And you claim that's true because you don't like graven images as some religions might believe. Now, how would a case be litigated? Well, there would be a number of threshold questions that would be asked of the religious believer. One, are you actually presenting a religion? I mean, is this actually a religious claim that you are, that you are offering here? And a court would have to decide what is a religion and what isn't a religion. That's a very uncomfortable decision to say the least as to determine what is a legitimate religion and what is not. A second threshold inquiry is you'd have to ask, is that religious belief, if there is one, burdened? And again, how do you determine when somebody's belief is burdened or not? It's the religious believer is really the only person who knows that. Uh, the state would be very uncomfortable, I suppose, in, in cross-examining whether or not a religious belief is burdened or not. And the third threshold question is, is the belief sincere? Now, how do you determine whether or not somebody's belief is sincere? Have you always believed that photographs are graven images, et cetera? Did you get that decision last week? That's a very, again, uncomfortable to say the least area of inquiry for the state to examine. And so what usually happens on these cases is that the religious believer would get a pass on all of these. And it would be assumed that it was a legitimate religion, that it was burdened if the believer said so, and that the beliefs were sincere. There were exceptions to this, but for the most part, 
you deferred. So that what did that mean? Well, that would mean that the state would have to come back and show that it had a compelling interest in order to be able to do the restriction and saying preventing voter fraud, maybe that's the reason or something else, a very high level of government support would be needed. And it would be particularly needed in this area uh, as opposed to the compelling interest test, which for those of you who are not lawyers is, is used in other areas, because you'd be balancing the state's interest against a very narrow class of objectors. Let me explain a case that I actually worked on a long time ago, which which presented this. The Hare Krishnas wanted to be able to engage in peripatetic solicitation at the Minnesota State Fair. That is, they wanted to be able to go out into the fair and solicit money. The Minnesota State Fair had a rule that you had to engage in activity like that behind a booth. Why did Minnesota have this rule? It was responding to two virulent cults the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, who for years had canvassed and sent out folks in the middle of the Minnesota State Fair, causing congestion problems and all kinds of things. And what, and what Minnesota wanted to do by this booth rule was try to make the fair more orderly. And if you've ever been to the Minnesota State Fair, it's very, very big business, okay? If, the, 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 if a compelling state interest test was applied uh, across the board, there would be pre, a pretty good compelling interest as to why you needed a booth space because so many groups would wanna go out and engage in this form of solicitation. You'd have chaos in the Minnesota State Fair and the state would likely win. But if you made just a free exercise claim, the state would have to show that its interest was compelling with respect to only the small group of people who asserted that they had a religious interest in going out into the middle of, of the fair. So they'd have to have an even higher reason to be able to do it. The result of this, and that's what part I think Justice Scalia was concerned about, is that if you took this compelling state interest test seriously, every law would be presumptively unconstitutional every law. And why is it every law? Because religious beliefs can mean anything. You can have religious beliefs that an environmental regulation violates some sort of religious precept, that a labor law regulation violates a particular precept. Virtually every law would be subject to this compelling interest test, would be presumptively unconstitutional if the Sherbert test was taken seriously. Well, the Sherbert test never was taken seriously. The free exercise claimants won in only two kinds of cases. One was the unemployment compensation cases that Sherbert was an example of in which somebody claimed that, that uh, they were be denying unemployment compensation because they were not available to work because of their religious beliefs. And the court came back and said, no, you got to, uh, you got to provide unemployment compensation. And a second case dealing with the Amish being excused from compulsory education requirements in Wisconsin. In virtually every other challenge, the free exercise claimant loss, leading everybody across the board, no matter where they were on this issue, to believe that the Sherbert test wasn't really being applied in the way that it should have been had it been seriously had it been seriously imposed. Um, so that was kind of the background uh, behind Sherbert. Now, as, as, as Kim pointed out, Sherbert itself came from a liberal court. What was causing the liberals to support this kind of compelling interest claim? And I think the answer on that is what they were concerned with was minority religions. In, in the Sherbert case itself, the claimant wanted unemployment con compensation. She was told she couldn't get it because she wasn't available to work on Saturday. And the reason why she wasn't able to work on Saturday was because she was a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, <clears throat> and probably, and, and what the liberals were concerned about was not that the state of South Carolina, which was the state involved in that case, not that it was going after some Seventh-day Adventists, but probably they hadn't thought about it when they created a law that you had to be available work on Saturday. And this was a way to accommodate minority religious beliefs uh, 
that might be inconsistent with a general law. I think that's what that was the sort of motivation by Justice Brennan, who was one of the most liberal justices in the history of the Supreme Court and why he authored that decision. But two cases decided during the Sherbert period, I think, undermined its ability to perceive. It's not just the court was applying the test inconsistently, but I think two cases really undermined Sherbert's viability. One was a case called Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation, in which the free exercise claimants in that case said they had a free exercise right not to pay their employees minimum wage, that that interfered with their religious beliefs. And the court rejected that claim. Now, is there a compelling interest underlying minimum wage laws? Sure there is in the sense that if one group is allowed to, to pay their employees less, they're gonna get a competitive advantage. And so you need to set the law at the same level so you don't have a race to the bottom. But would there be a compelling interest with respect to just a small group of people upon whom who are claiming religious exemption? Maybe less so because it's unlikely that wages would be depressed just because the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation were able to pay their employees less. Well, the court, without taking the free exercise claim all that seriously, rejected the claim and upheld the Fair Labor Standards Act as applying to the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation. The second case was actually a case in which the free exercise claimant won, a case called Thomas versus Review Board. And in that case, it was an unemployment insurance compensation case, an employee of a foundry said that he could not work there anymore. He was not available for work because he was being transferred from one part of the factory to the other part of the factory and the other part of the factory made armaments, gun turrets. And he said he was a Jehovah's Witness and he said, um, my beliefs prevent me from working on armaments. The state introduced some evidence indicating that it wasn't a particular tenant of the Jehovah's Witnesses that you couldn't work in an armaments factory. They actually had another Jehovah Witness testify on that. Um, but the court was unpersuaded by that and said, and I think rightly, that it doesn't make a difference what your formal religions tenets are, it's what you believe. And if he believed this, he believed this. But there was a serious question of whether this was a religious belief or not, or just an objection to war. And I want you to think uh, yourself for a minute, you probably all hopefully think stealing is, is wrong. Do you think stealing is wrong because of a religious motivation or because you just think it's wrong morally? If you read the record in the Thomas case, it's unclear whether the petitioner himself really founded his belief on a religious basis or on a moral basis. He said it was religious, the court deferred to that, but it also at the same time said, you know, if Thomas's objection was philosophical, he wouldn't be entitled to an exemption from this law. So think about that. What it did was what Thomas indicated, would there be a preference of beliefs? If you had a strong belief against working in a factory uh, that was making armaments and, but it wasn't based on religion, you would lose the case, but if it was based on religion, you would win the case. So it created a disparity in the treatment of various kinds of belief. So I think these led to, these concerns led to Justice Scalia to decide the way he did, the problems that you get in examining the threshold requirements for a free exercise claim as I said before, religiosity, sincerity, burden, and the fact that it was creating a hierarchy of deeply felt beliefs, one kind of belief over, over another. And that, that, that set the stage for Smith. And as, and as uh, Kim pointed out, Smith did not completely uh, overturn Sherbert. It said that Sherbert could survive there, that it kept an anti-discrimination principle there. And I think Sherbert is really an anti-discrimination case, the unemployment compensation cases, because what the court said is if you allow people excuses for non-religious reasons for being unavailable for work, you had to allow them to be unavailable for work for religious reasons. 
And then it distinguished without overruling Yoder by claiming that there was a hybrid constitutional right here between religious belief and the right to bring up your kids the way you, the way you want. Um, that was Smith. That set that, and at that time, it created an uproar going from the left to the right, suggesting that the uh, decision was wrong. And there were just a few of us that thought the decision was actually, was actually right. And in my case, it was mostly be, uh, a lot because of the inquiry of, of the threshold inquiry there, but also the question of creating a hierarchy of, of constitutional belief systems, uh, one, over, one over the other. The question before us today is, should Smith be overruled? The Fulton case, as Kim pointed out, is bringing that before the court. My guess is they're going to they're going to hold for the uh, um, they're going to hold for the religious claimant in that case. But I don't think they're going to overturn Smith in that case because they don't have to do it in order to reach that particular result. But normally, when you're looking at whether a case should be overturned. And that's the question, should Smith be overturned? The court has identified the factors you look at. And I'm citing from a 1919 decision of the court where the court says you look at the, the workability of the rule it established, its consistency with other related decisions and reliance on that decision and the quality of the reasoning and have things changed. Well, has anything really changed since Smith to indicate why that decision should be overturned? Well, one thing has is political, it's the culture wars. As I indicated to you before, a lot of the liberal motivation behind Sherbert was to prevent minorities from being discriminated against. But religious exemptions were started to use by some to get exemptions from civil rights laws. During the Sherbert period, for example, Bob Jones University wanted to challenge an IRS rule which prevented them from discriminating on the basis of race. Uh, and still being entitled to tax exempt status. So liberals started seeing a problem when exemptions were being used to be excused from civil rights laws. And this put the issue into the heart of the culture war problems in a way it wasn't there in, in Smith. Um, but that's not really a change in the law, that's just changing in the politics surrounding exemptions. And with respect to workability, which is one of the key things the court looks at when it's gonna to decide to overturn a case, one of the very reasons why Smith was decided was because Sherbert itself proved to be so unworkable. So it would be ironic at least to be able to, to overturn that decision uh, in favor of a less workable standard, at least under the court standard for when it's appropriate to overturn previous decisions. Now, what does this all mean for the future of religion? Religion still has a great deal of protection. You cannot discriminate against religion. And in a couple of recent cases, the court said that means you cannot provide benefits to some groups and exclude religious groups. Uh, much of religious practice is, is, is things like prayer and proselytization. Those are protected already under the speech clause. So there's a great deal of protection that, that exists outside the need to create exemptions from otherwise neutral laws. All that Smith really does is eliminate preferences for one type of belief over another. And let me, let me end with, uh, with going back to Rod Smith for a minute, because when we had all these discussions, Rod was actually persuaded, at least in part, by the notion that it would be inappropriate to prefer religious beliefs over deeply, deeply held moral beliefs. So what he would have done was broaden who gets the exemption to going beyond just religious believers to others who had deeply held moral objection. And he would have had some authority there in the, the conscientious objector cases of the 1960s. I'm not sure the court's gonna go there because the problem of, with exemptions is a, is a serious one. When you say that some people can be excused from laws under the, the, the constitution that mandates that some people can be excused from laws while others must obey the laws. But like anything else that Rod Smith talked about, it's certainly worth taking seriously. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Professor, Professor Marshall. It's good to see you again. Professor Marshall and I uh, met uh, well, back in probably about 1992, and he was one of the, the early and vigorous defenders of the Smith decision at a time when very few were defending it. And uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of academic defenders um, of Smith have come around to uh, his point of view. It's great to be on this panel with, uh, with Kim uh, and Adele, and I look forward to the colloquy following um, our, our individual presentations. I'm not a legal scholar, although I sometimes try to pretend to be. Uh, I'm, I'm an attorney. I represent religious organizations and people of faith as I try to carve out some legal space to practice their religion in an increasingly secular world that is increasingly hostile to their beliefs and their institutions. From that practical perspective, my view is that Smith was and is a jurisprudential failure. When the Supreme Court creates a constitutional test, we typically assume that it is doing so to carry out the command of what the Constitution says or originally meant. And so, as we've heard, the Supreme Court's decision in Smith was an effort to provide a test to carry out the mandate of the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, which says that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion, and that extends to government generally. Of course, no right is absolute, and no one believes that the Free Exercise Clause authorizes human sacrifice as a religious practice. Every constitutional right has to have some test to filter out bad claims and frivolous claims and, and claims that are just, that just arise in the context of having to live with other people um, and to ensure that, that a constitutional right stays moored to its purpose. The Smith decision was an effort to create such a test. The problem is that the test does a really poor job of protecting the free exercise of religion. That, after all, was its purpose. We can talk about all the other challenges that protecting the free exercise of religion might create, but that was the purpose of the Smith test, or that's at least should have been its purpose. In fact, in many ways, the test was no test at all. In practical application, how it's actually applied on the ground, Smith means that claims of free exercise almost always lose. Free exercise claims and defenses are typically summarily dismissed, even in cases of real religious hardship, not because religious exercise isn't being prohibited by government, but because the test is so lenient and so easily evaded that government almost automatically wins. Indeed, the defenders of Smith think that this is a good thing, or at least a necessary thing. I do not. I believe that Smith was flawed in its conception and has been flawed in its application. And here are a few reasons why. Now, it was noted that, that Justice Scalia was the author of the Smith decision, and that, of course, is true. Um, Justice Scalia was not anti-religion. Um, you know, he was a fierce Catholic. Uh, he believed very much in the free exercise of religion, but he was also traumatized to an extent um, by the, the Warren court and what was understood then to be sort of liberal activism in the area uh, of rights. And so Justice Scalia, who took uh, Warren Berger's place on the Supreme Court, and Warren Berger had been uh, the Chief Justice after Chief Justice Earl Warren and had continued some of those, uh, those tendencies, he was deeply concerned about moderating the exercise of judicial power. He thought it had gone too far. He had a strong dislike of judge-made balancing tests. He really hated balancing and a strong preference for clear, simple tests and democratic decision-making. In his view, we're all citizens subject to the law made in the democratic process. If the law is not good, we can petition the legislature to change it. And it's not for the courts to be handing out exemptions to the laws that we all must live under. This is kind of the, the equal citizenship um, notion. Hence, one of the primary rationales for Smith was that applying strict scrutiny, this very high standard that Professor Marshall has talked about, to every free exercise claim would mean that, quote, each conscience would become a law unto itself, or that judges would have to weigh the social importance of all laws against the centrality of all religious beliefs. That, Justice Scalia said, would lead to social chaos. And we know that social chaos and lawlessness are not what the founders had in mind when drafting the First Amendment, so that couldn't be right. Well, what did the founders have in mind? And to answer that, Justice Scalia went back to the Reynolds decision in the 1800s, which dealt with the federal government's suppression of the religious practice of plural marriage. 
And there the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment protects an absolute right to believe anything you want, but it doesn't necessarily protect the right to act on those beliefs. Justice Scalia kind of grabbed on to that belief action distinction and refashioned it into the simple rule that we've already heard talked about, which, which was that under the Free Exercise Clause, courts will not provide religious exemptions from religiously neutral and generally applicable laws. Government can't target religion for special burdens. That's a kind of an equality principle, but neither can religion demand special exemptions from the law. As long as the law applies to everyone, the idea went, that is pretty much the end of it under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. However, what about situations where religion needs special accommodations? What if government decided that consumption of all alcohol was bad and wanted to ban all of it? Wouldn't such a religiously neutral and generally, generally applicable law prohibit the Catholic Mass and other performances of the Lord's Supper? Well, that didn't seem quite right. It still doesn't seem quite right. But Justice Scalia wasn't worried about that. Uh, his view was that a country that respects religion would surely reflect that respect in its laws. Majoritarian religious beliefs and practices don't really need special judicial protection in any way, he thought, because they will get protected through the democratic process. So while courts may not hand out religious exemptions under the Free Exercise Clause, legislatures certainly could, and indeed they would be expected to grant exemptions to lift burdens. Hence, the Catholics had nothing to fear, and neither did any of the other uh, larger, more established religions. Legislatures would take care of them while, of course, not taking care of human sacrifice practices of, of, Aztecs, of Aztec priests or those who seem to have strange beliefs about, um, about their uh, driver's licenses and images and all of that, which wasn't really much of a concern for him. And all would be well. Again, implicit in all of this was that American society simply can't afford to grant judicial exceptions for minority religious practices that increasingly rub against the grain of majoritarian ways of life, and especially against an ever-expanding welfare and administrative state. Now, en route to this conclusion, Justice Scalia had a lot of cases to clear away, and he sought to distinguish uh, some decades of, of decisions that had come to different conclusions. Um, I don't think, and I, and I think I'm joined in this by, by many scholars, I don't think his way of distinguishing those cases was necessarily uh, very um, convincing, and I think a lot of scholars have noted that. Um, indeed, I think that, that, that the way that Justice Scalia got to his decision in Smith um, had some fundamental problems. First of all, the test Justice Scalia created um, had one kind of primary overarching flaw. It didn't really affirmatively protect religious freedom uh, at all. Um, it protected equality, and it protected religious belief, and, and, and that's important, but not the free exercise of religion like the First Amendment expressly provided. Now, this is no small matter, um, not to be persecuted because of your belief, not to be excluded from equal enjoyment of the rights of citizenship because of your religion. Make no mistake, those are very, very important advances in Western civilization and, and in human rights generally, but they don't quite capture the notion of being protected in the free exercise of religion. So again, what if government said that no one could kneel in their houses? Now that would be religiously neutral and generally applicable, but it would also prevent people from kneeling in prayer. Well, that can't be right. Just like the earlier example of banning the Catholic mass by essentially banning um, the consumption of all alcohol, even if you weren't targeting the Catholic mass, that just doesn't seem right. What if the law banned all buildings with pointy architectural features on roofs? Could the building of churches with steeples really be banned in the United States of America? That didn't seem right either. What if a general law imposed a huge burden on religious exercise, but there was no good reason at all for the law or the burden? I mean, government just, just hadn't even considered something. Uh, why should government get away with burdening religion, even if it really doesn't need to? We don't treat many other rights that way. We don't treat privacy rights that way. We don't treat abortion rights that way. So that was problematic. The test didn't really accomplish um, what a 
a test really needs to accomplish when it's in the area of a constitutional right, which is to, to uphold the right in some kind of a vigorous and, and practical way. Instead, what began to happen was the right, the free exercise of religion, that right began to be reconceived as nothing more than an equality right or a right not to be targeted based on your religion. Second, Justice Scalia's social chaos um, idea seemed to make sense, allowing everyone to disobey the law based on their religion would surely cause chaos and havoc, right? I mean, we, we get these kinds of examples about driver's licenses and, and speed limits and so forth that, that would seem to indicate that we can't have everybody um, having their religion dictate, you know, minimum wage laws and all of those kinds of things. Except that having a strong legal test protecting religion hadn't done anything of the sort in the prior decades. Um, the strong test, that, that strict scrutiny test, had play in the joints. And of course, it was true um, that the courts had been flexible and maybe hadn't applied it as rigorously as possible. But that's just part of wise decision making uh, in the context of, of constitutional rights. And remember, the claimed burden had to be substantial, not just incidental or the product of living life with other people who see things differently. Um, some of those kinds of notions would seem to deal with, with driver's license issues. And if the government had a very good reason for burdening religion and did so in a way that was as sensitive to religion as reasonably possible, then the government could and did win. And yes, of course, the courts didn't always apply this rigorously, but the fear of social chaos was completely overblown in my view. As I'll mention in a few moments, a few years after Smith, Congress passed a law that reinstated the strict scrutiny test, this test that supposedly would, would cause social chaos. 30 years later, there's still no social chaos and Justice Scalia himself signed on to decisions upholding religious rights in that context. Third, to this day, nobody really knows what a neutral and generally applicable law is. A law banning murder would seem to fit, as would most criminal laws. But what about land use laws, or personal injury laws, or civil rights laws, or health care laws? Those have lots of exceptions for lots of different interests. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, for example, doesn't impose its mandates on a business until it has 50 employees. So really, you know, Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employers are simply exempted. Um, is that neutral and generally applicable? The employment non-discrimination rule in the 1964 Civil Rights Act doesn't kick in until a business has 15 employees. Is that neutral and generally applicable? Land use laws are filled with exceptions and discretionary decisions. Are those religiously neutral and generally applicable? If Smith means that there are no free exercise exemptions from laws that truly apply equally to everyone, then perhaps that's not such a concern. I think it would not be a concern in the area of criminal law, but there are very few of those laws in the civil law context. And Smith defenders um, uh, rarely find that um, only such laws fail uh, under, its, under the Smith rule. In short, Smith couldn't account for the actual words of the First Amendment. It was based on fears of chaos that were really overblown. It failed to account for past precedent. And instead of making things more coherent, it actually raised many as many questions as it solved. I believe that Smith was flawed from the outset as a matter of doctrine and law. But perhaps more importantly, I also believe that Smith was flawed as a practical matter. Instead of the respect that Justice Scalia hoped for, almost immediately every government official and petty bureaucrat learned the language of Smith and claim that his or her favorite regulation qualified there. I, I began to think that there was some kind of a memo that had gone out that basically said, all you need to do is claim that something is religiously neutral and generally applicable and you're off the hook. And for the most part, um, courts agreed. And the practical result here was very serious. Um, individuals bargain with the state. They bargain with the government when they're uh, religious rights uh, are in trouble. They try to go in and say, hey, this is my situation. Can you, can you give me a break? And what happened was that you couldn't bargain with the government anymore. Um, they basically just listened to you and said, sorry, um, you know, we got the memo. Um, our regulation is neutral and generally applicable. They claimed every regulation was neutral and generally applicable, and therefore you're not entitled to any accommodation. See you later. That happened all the time. 
and it still happens. There is a bureaucratic tendency towards, towards efficiency and uniformity. And, and that really means that they don't want to grant any exceptions, even when it wouldn't undermine anything about uh, their own regulation. Even after the Supreme Court created a little bit of clarity as to what neutrality and general, general applicability are um, in the context of the chicken sacrifice case, which some of you may have heard about, um, legislators and bureaucrats just really had to be a little more clever. If they simply crafted their laws and regulations so as not to mention religion and to have a patina of general applicability, then by and large, they would be fine in the courts. The outcome was typically that religion lost. But perhaps the biggest indication that Smith hasn't really worked on its own terms is that both legislatures and courts have had to create new laws and rulings to avoid it. Three years after Smith, in one of the last great acts of bipartisan lawmaking that we've seen, in 1993, Congress passed almost unanimously the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which restored the strict scrutiny test. Many states passed their own state level Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, or RIFRAs as we call them. And as mentioned in the nearly three decades since, judges have been able to reach reasonable outcomes that have neither led to social chaos nor prevented government from carrying on its important interests. In many cases, federal courts are doing under RIFRA, this new law, uh, exactly what's not new anymore, 30 years old, exactly what Justice Scalia said they couldn't and must not do under the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment and they are doing it reasonably well. And even the Supreme Court has had to carve out exceptions to Smith. When the Supreme Court addressed whether the First Amendment allows churches and other religious organizations to hire and fire their own ministers without having to comply with federal civil rights laws, the answer was yes, and it was unanimous. Interestingly enough, Smith was irrelevant to that outcome. Um, I'm not even sure the court even cited Smith. That was the Hosanna Tabor case. The court didn't say that civil rights laws aren't neutral and generally applicable. Instead, drawing from many pre-Smith decisions that essentially just ignored Smith in recognizing a ministerial exception to the civil rights laws. That is telling, it's very telling. The Supreme Court clearly does not see itself bound by Smith's rule in cases involving religious organizations and their internal affairs. And not surprisingly, several justices of the Supreme Court have already called for Smith to be re-examined. And right now in the Fulton case, which is before the Supreme Court, which involves application of LGBT anti-discrimination norms to Catholic social services in the context of foster care, the court has to decide whether Smith allows the city of Philadelphia to bar Catholic participation unless the Catholic social services abandons its religious standards. Adele may talk about that a little bit more. It might decide that case narrowly, as, as uh, Professor Marshall suggests, holding that nasty anti-Catholic comments by local officials violate Smith, or it might decide that the time to re-examine Smith has begun. I hope that the court does re-examine Smith. The free exercise clause of the First Amendment cannot be a source of social chaos or preclude government from performing its basic functions, of course. No one denies that but neither can we any longer pretend that mere neutrality and general applicability are sufficient to secure the great promise of the First Amendment to safeguard religious freedom, to safeguard the free exercise of religion. As government continues to expand its regulatory reach, especially with the current effort to extend anti-discrimination laws deep into religious communities, deep into religious realms that had not heretofore been regulated in that way, if the Supreme Court remains committed to securing the free exercise of religion, it will have no choice but to adopt other tests that can perform the vital role better than Smith's. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Professor Marshall. Um, and thank you, Kim. Uh, my name is Adele Keim. I'm a litigator uh, with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. We're a nonprofit law firm. Um, you may have heard of our work. Uh, we defended a Muslim inmate in Arkansas State Prison, um, or you may have heard of our work defending Jewish girls schools in New York, uh, or really you may have heard of our work uh, at a mosque in Tennessee or, or a church in Alabama. We like to say that we represented everyone from A to Z, from Anglicans to Zoroastrians. Um, if you're interested in understanding why we have this perspective on religious liberty, I would highly recommend looking at a book by Seamus Hassan, who founded Beckett. Uh, it's called The Right to be Wrong. Uh, Seamus was a lawyer 
uh, at the time of Smith, uh, and he also witnessed the birth of RIFRA, uh, and he founded the Beckett Fund um, just after all those events. I met Seamus in law school when I was a student at Notre Dame, and his work had a profound impact on me uh, as a young litigator even before I joined Beckett. Here's why. Seamus had two insights that are really important to understanding the conversation that we're having here today. The first insight that he had was that religion is a natural part of human culture. History in the United States and around the world teaches us that if you try to suppress religious communities and religious people, you may succeed with some and for a time, but in the long run, you will fail. In the American experiment, we learned this even before independence. During the colonial era, uh, there, was a, there were groups of dissenters that started to pop up, especially in New England. Um, Quakers and others uh, began to come in to what was supposed to be a largely homogenous religious country, religious colony, and started to preach a different message. At first, the authorities resorted to increasingly draconian measures to silence them until they finally had to put to death a young woman named Mary Dwyer who would not be silenced, refused to be quiet. That was a watershed moment. After that point, what was really a tragedy, I think we can all agree, the colonial societies, the governments and the, the people in them said, you know what, this is wrong. We may disagree profoundly with what the Quakers are saying. We may wish them to be quiet, but instead of trying to silence them, the better and wiser course is to allow space for them to dissent. Those events hundreds of years ago planted the seeds for what is now the American understanding of religious liberty and the tradition of protecting religious liberty for all. So Seamus' second insight was not original to him. He believed that all people have an obligation to seek the truth and to pursue it when they have found it. That is why we have an obligation to respect people's intellectual and religious freedom, even when we believe they're wrong. That's why he called his book, The Right to Be Wrong. That's why he founded Beckett to defend Anglicans, Zoroastrians, Muslims, Jewish groups, Catholic groups, Protestant groups, groups who believe that they are right and that others are wrong, all deserve a hearing in the court all deserve protection in our laws because the right to seek the truth and to the obligation to follow it, these are essential aspects of our human rights and our human dignity. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a litigator. I like to win these good principles of defending human dignity and human rights for all also have good consequences for everyone. So at Beckett, we understand that when we protect religious freedom for one faith community, we are protecting it for everyone because the same law that protects the mosque on Friday also protects the synagogue on Saturday and the church on Sunday. So turning back to Smith, the aftermath of Smith illustrates both of these core principles. Smith was a stunning legal setback with far reaching consequences for American religious communities, especially for minority faith groups that were going to be less effective at getting exemptions passed in laws on the front end. Nevertheless, religious communities persisted. They persisted by banding together with people they thought were wrong from other faiths and working to pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act or RIFRA. They persisted in passing baby RIFRAs in 21 states 
And, and this is the part that I'm going to talk about today. They persisted in urging the courts to interpret and apply the constitutional guarantee of free exercise in a way that still protected their fundamental rights, even after Smith. They did this in at least two ways. So first, religious communities raised aspects of free exercise law that Smith did not reach, specifically religious autonomy and what is now called the ministerial exception. Second, they pressed the courts across the country to give teeth to Smith, to the standard that Smith established by focusing on what does it really mean for a law to be neutral and generally applicable. So first, religious autonomy. Religious communities understood that there were still parts of the free exercise clause that survived Smith. So for example, courts for decades and decades had held that it was inappropriate for secular judges to reach inside the four walls of a house of worship and decide matters of internal church doctrine or church discipline. So in Hosanna Tabor, an ordained teacher at a Lutheran school who organized chapel and taught religion for hours every week sued her school for disability discrimination. Beckett represented the church school and the Supreme Court held in a 9-0 decision in 2012 that secular courts could not tell religious organizations who was equipped to teach the faith to the next generation. The Supreme Court recently reaffirmed this principle just this year in two cases called Our Lady of Guadalupe and St. James School, also litigated by Beckett. So on this issue of religious autonomy, on this issue of whether uh, people could use the government and use the law to reach inside the four walls of a religious community and tell the religious community what to teach, how to teach, who, who to have teach. Religious communities persisted in asserting their fundamental rights and they won. Second, in clarifying the Smith standard, Smith applied to laws that were neutral and generally applicable. And we've talked a lot about that on this panel today. And what does that mean? And theoretically, is that consistent? And how do you apply it? Well, as litigators, uh, we at Beckett look at that and say, if the law fails, either neutrality or general applicability, then the rational basis standard in Smith really should no longer apply. The Supreme Court agreed in part in a 1993 case called Lukumi. Lukumi involved a Santeria church that sought to establish a worship center in Hialeah, Florida. Now, Santeria, if you're not familiar with it, is an Afro-Caribbean religion. It uses animal sacrifices in its religious worship. And shortly after the church announced its plans to establish a worship center in Hialeah, the city council issued a series of ordinances that banned animal sacrifice. What did the Supreme Court do? the unanimous Supreme Court held that these ordinances were neither neutral nor generally applicable. They did that for two main reasons. First, because they found looking at the ordinances, they had singled out Santeria practices while doing their best to uh, exempt or protect other practices. For example, a hunter bringing home, ritual slaughter for, uh, was banned, but a hunter was allowed to kill an animal and bring him home to his garage and, uh, and dress the meat. Um, you know, restaurants were still, meat was allowed to be killed for, for consumption. Other kind of uh, exemptions that on their face really should have applied, were affecting the same kind of behavior that the church wanted to be involved in. And also there was a pretty good record in Lukumi that the, the city council really didn't want Santeria practitioners in their town. In other words, not only did they exempt a lot of comparable secular behavior, but they also made it very clear that these laws were specifically targeted at Santeria practitioners. So they won unanimously at the Supreme Court. So you would think, great victory, the Smith, the Smith standard has been clarified, religious organizations persisted, and now they have resurrected from Smith, which was not a great decision, this, uh, this at least workable standard that at least protects them under certain circumstances. Unfortunately, however, Lukumi was one of those cases that was really almost too good 
because it involved both a law that had many exemptions and a clear record that the city intended targeting. Q, 30 years of debate in the lower courts over whether really you had to get around Smith, you had to show targeting plus exemptions or whether it was enough to show that the, that the government was exempting comparable secular behavior. Now, I represent religious communities across the country, all kinds of religious communities, some very popular, some very large, some very unpopular, some very small. Um, and I think that if the government gives away exemptions to its laws for medical reasons or for political reasons uh, or for uh, reasons related to cronyism, uh, then it should certainly treat religion at least as favorably as it treats its political friends or its, uh, the, you know, the economic interests. It should at least treat religion as well as it treats uh, other people that it's exempting from its laws. But a lot of courts have gotten tied up on this. They've struggled with applying this Smith standard after Lukumi. And they have really asked litigants in some cases, and I have to say they tend to do this more when the faith is smaller or less understood. Um, they have been asking to show the kind of egregious examples of targeting that were present in Lukumi. And that is a very high burden because that gets you into the heart and mind of the lawmakers. Um, it's hard to prove and it's also really messy. Um, I don't think the Supreme Court really views the Smith standard in the way that some of the lower courts have viewed the Smith standard. And I think you can see traces of this in the COVID cases. So for example, this fall, when the Supreme Court was presented with a challenge to New York's uh, COVID restrictions, which imposed very strict occupancy li limits on houses of worship, 10 people, 10 people in sometimes, these are limits imposed on, on houses of worship that sometimes had fire marshal capacities in the hundreds, if not the thousands, large places of worship in Brooklyn and elsewhere, while simultaneously saying to Macy's, hey, you can have 25% capacity, which in a large store like they have in New York City uh, can mean hundreds and hundreds of people. The Supreme Court said where you have exempted uh, comparable behavior uh, and made exceptions to your asserted interest uh, for these businesses, you need to treat religious practice at least as well as you treat uh, these, these other businesses. So I think the Supreme Court sees this standard at least a little bit more closely to a little bit more closely to the standard um, that I think is the correct one. Uh, but lower courts have really struggled with whether targeting is also necessary. So Smith really created through this an unintended consequences rule. And that brings me to the Fulton case. Uh, which is currently pending before the Supreme Court, which has been mentioned on this panel. It is an opportunity for the Supreme Court to definitively clarify the standard in Smith or repudiate it altogether. Fulton, which is a Beckett case, uh, is a case where Philadelphia um, has really struggled to identify a neutral and generally applicable law and has decided that it can exclude the Catholic Church from foster care in Philadelphia because of the Catholic Church's beliefs about marriage, which are well known. Now, I can't imagine that Justice Scalia and the rest of the Supreme Court that decided Smith would have imagined that it would lead to a result like that. But the lower courts have said again and again, they think these policies are neutral and generally applicable and that Sharon L. Fulton, a foster mom that we represent and Catholic social services will lose under Smith. Like I said, Fulton could be the end of the road for Smith. We have urged the Supreme Court to reverse it, or it could be this definitive clarification of what neutral and generally applicable means. Either outcome would benefit religious communities in the United States immensely. But the bottom line is whether Fulton is a win or a loss, the basic fundamental truth that you need to understand about religious communities in the United States is that they will continue to do what they have always done when facing government pressure to abandon their beliefs. 
And that's that they will persist. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who um, just shared with us. That was wonderful. It's it's just a great way to spend an afternoon listening to experts on religious freedom talk about it. And um, Bill, um, would you like three minutes to respond? I know three minutes isn't much for all that's been said, but do you think you... Well, what that? makes you think that I would disagree with anything that's been said so far? First of all, let me, let me compliment both Adele and Alexander for a really terrific presentations and Alexander with you particularly uh, it's just making me feel badly that I did such a bad job of persuading you 30 years ago <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so obviously obviously living with um, what's interesting though about what what Adele and Alexander have really said is that religious freedom has done really well since Smith um, as Alexander points out you're exactly right there uh, when when people have found the application of Smith too harsh there have been legislative exemptions that have been passed. As Adele pointed out, um, there are doctrinal ways that uh, Smith doesn't apply, including on important issues, very important issues of, of religious autonomy. Um, the equal treatment indicate uh, policy that she identified that you cannot treat religion worse than other uh, comparable groups seems to make uh, that has been an effective avenue for making sure that religion hasn't been singled out. So they're absolutely right that Smith, despite all what was said about it, really hasn't done that much to, uh, to really interfere with basic religious freedom. And again, if you just point in the speech clause, the speech clause protects prayer, proselytization, and all that. The question that I'm left at the end of it, though, is to go back to the question of equal treatment in the other way. If we, uh, in the COVID cases may be an example, if, if religious groups are entitled to, to gather and, and exceed a 10 person limit, well, shouldn't groups who get together to say to protest racism or to protest gun violence or to protest anything, shouldn't they be able to gather as well? The problem with the free exercise exemption is that it exempts only religious believers and creates a favoritism of them over groups or individuals presenting equally deeply felt strong moral or philosophical commitment. And then I go back a little bit to that Thomas case. Uh, I'm sure Thomas didn't really know if his objection to working in an armaments factory was based on a deeply held philosophical belief or moral belief, or if it was based on a religious belief. Yet if you characterize it one way, you get him ha uh, being granted an exemption. And if you characterize it the other way, he doesn't. And why should the First Amendment, which also protects freedom of speech and secular conscience, pre prefer one type of conscience over another? And that was one of the major problems I think with narrowing, uh, only allowing religious believers to get that exemption. With respect to, uh, we didn't talk too much about originalism, but I think everybody would think that, uh, must agree that it's fairly ambiguous as to whether the framers wanted to allow exemptions or not. They originally had a proposed exemption in the second amendment for conscientious objection to war, but they eliminated that indicating that maybe they didn't see a right to religious exemptions in the constitution. Two very conservative scholars, Michael McConnell and Philip Hamburger have come to the diametrically opposed uh, answers as to whether that was involved or not. So I thought they'd throw that in as well, but really really the issue, and again, I go back to Rod Smith, the one that moved him the most was this question of in a world in which all of our beliefs are so broad uh, from one end of the secular spectrum to the very religious on the other end, is it really appropriate to distinguish between one kind of one kind of system of beliefs as opposed to another? But you know, Adele and Alexander, great job. Thanks. Could, okay. Can I respond to a couple of those things? Yes, you may very quickly. Very, very quickly. Okay. Um, People have done, religious people have done pretty well um, since Smith and religious organizations. I, I think that's true. Um, but it is true despite Smith, not because of Smith. Um, it is true because of, you know, as, as Adele mentioned, 
um, you know, a, a couple dozen um, uh, states enacted uh, RIFRAs. Uh, it's true because the federal government enacted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. In other words, that 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 these political entities then enacted the very standard that supposedly couldn't work at the Supreme Court level, and then have have been applying it. Um, it's it, it hasn't had such a bad impact because because of cases like the ones that Adele has talked about, which have shown that, that, that the Smith standard is inadequate. So there's an entire realm of cases, um, the religious autonomy cases that Adele mentioned. You know, what do you do with religious faith communities and, and their own internal uh, workings? And, and, and is the Smith decision really applicable in that context? And for the most part, the Supreme Court is coming down and saying, you know, it really isn't or really shouldn't be. And so Smith is, is, is little by little being picked apart, um, you know, in a variety of ways. And, and yes, in the end, it hasn't been uh, as bad as it could be. Um, one of the things that, that Professor Marshall mentions is, that is, is essentially that the problem with free exercise exemptions is that they favor um, free exercise. Well, that is the very point of the religion clauses. Uh, it's not the only point, but it's one of the it's one of the core points. We do elevate certain rights um, more. You know, they are more elevated than than other rights and and other interests. That being said, most of the free speech expressive rights really do cover um, you know many of the other circumstances that that would be a concern. But I don't think you know this is not a bug of the Constitution. It's actually a feature that it favors religious exercise. That that is an affirmative. Um, favoritism for a certain kind of right that history and tradition, and I believe morality as well, um, have demonstrated is very important to protect so that we can have peace in our country and the basic elements of freedom in our country. So I don't think that's a bug. I think that's a feature of, uh, of the First Amendment, and it's one that I'm, I'm grateful to defend. Okay, that sounds good. And I, this is a little bit of a follow-up to that. Um, but I'm going to take it. Sorry, guys, I'm supposed to give you questions. But this one asked something that I wanted to be sure uh, the audience understood, and I wasn't sure it came across in our presentations. So the question from someone in the audience is, if state and national legislation has somewhat invalidated Smith, we've talked about RIFRA and the state RIFRAs, what more would the Supreme Court's overturning of Smith do? And I'll answer that and then see if you all have some other answers, but I wanted to be clear. So um, as we've said in 1993, in response to, Riff, uh, to Smith, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was passed at the federal level, um, as we call it RIFRA for shorthand. And when it was passed, it, its terms, Congress said this applies to federal laws, state and local laws, because that's where Smith the free exercise clause applied to federal, state, and local laws. Um, but four years later, uh, in a case called Bernie versus Flores, the Supreme Court slapped Congress's hands and said, no, you don't. You can tell the federal government, Congress, what it can do as far as free exercise. So the Religious Freedom Restoration Act can apply across the board to federal laws and federal actions but you overstepped your constitutional authority, even under section five of the 14th amendment by telling the state and local officials what their free exercise um, test should be. So um, RIFRA, which is really what protects our religious freedom at the federal level more than the first amendment, I'm sorry to say, it only applies at the federal level. And so, um, as we've heard about 21, 22, 23, we're not, I'm not sure, number of states have passed some sort of limitation and uh, a RIFRA and some of the state Supreme Courts have taken, uh, said that their test goes back to pre-Smith. But there are a lot of states where right now Smith is the law for any challenge to state and local governments. And so if the Catholic Services wins in Fulton and if, the Supreme Court overrules Smith, we would regain that constitution, strong constitutional protection as to state and local laws. Um, if someone wants to respond to that, they can, but I'm gonna 
you can respond after I read the first question, just so we make sure we get the audience in here. And a couple of people have asked a variation on this question. So um, what do you think the founder's reaction would be to the Smith test? Is it a good test to explain what they were meaning in the First Amendment? Or is it a testament to how the country's changed more than the founders could ever have imagined? I think all of you have kind of touched on that, but I think I'll start with Adele and then Bill and then Alexander if you want to address that and address what I, the question I spoke to as well. I think, I think, it, and why I started talking about kind of the first principles of these are, this is about human dignity. This is about respecting um, other people's uh, obligation to seek the truth and to, and to follow it when they find it, even if you believe they're just wrong. They're just wrong. Um, I, I don't think that that's changed. <laughs> I don't think that's changed in 300 years of American history. And I don't think it would change if, you know, we are still, uh, you know, a country 300 years from now, and I hope we are. Um, and I think that the founders insight, which you got to remember was, was amazing at the time that they were going to tolerate religious dissent on this level. I mean, it's not a bro an unbroken narrative of of, uh, of toleration by any means. If you go back to the colonial era, there's lots of examples of religious oppression that we would not accept today. Um, but that decision to tolerate dissent and Professor Marshall to tolerate secular as well as religious dissent, I mean, the, the seeds of protecting secular conscience were in those early recognitions of religious conscience, I, 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 I think. Um, so that has not changed and our our technology can change and our society can change but that obligation to seek the truth and the recognition that something very bad happens in your society and your government when you start railroading individual conscience but also religious communities uh is is something that i think we really need to hold on to and that's one of the reasons that's where i go when defending the little sisters of the poor i'm not catholic i'm not a nun but when I say, look, you're willing to shut down a 200 year old women's or health organization that has operated around the world, saving people. I mean, it got started in France in the 19th century, saving elderly people who were dying on the streets and bringing them in and creating homes where they could live out their days with dignity. You're gonna railroad that organization with millions of dollars in fines because you wanna be more, slightly more effective in your policy goal of delivering contraceptives to American women. Now look, I don't agree with the little sisters about contraceptives, I don't. And I, but I hope that we can all agree that the country that put a man on the moon can find another way to accomplish its policy goals than coercing the conscience of a bunch of nuns. I hope we can agree about that. So I think that those things haven't changed, the, the human dignity, the human rights portion of this hasn't changed and that we as a society, as we become more diverse, as we welcome more people from around the world, only need to remember this more than the founders who are dealing with a much narrower band of religious difference than we are today. We need these principles even more than they did. And I hope we hold on to them no matter how dearly we hold our own policy preferences or goals, we hold on even more dearly to these principles of human dignity and human rights that are reflected in the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Well, what, how, they, how the framers would respond to today's society is, is, inter, is, is an unanswerable question, certainly. But I do think it's interesting that they put free exercise and free speech into the same amendment. Because I do think it, I do think they saw them as the same part of an overall enterprise of the importance of conscience and the importance for searching for truth. Whether they would suggest or believe that one avenue to do that is preferred over another avenue, I'm a little bit more skeptical about. Because uh, they understood, I think that 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 conscience is more than just a religious conscience, and and I. I and Adele, you're you're right that that uh, some of these 
early cases talk about protecting conscience, but the idea of a free exercise religious exemption does not protect the secular conscience. It protects only a religious conscience. And that's one of the problems I think in, in, uh, in why, well, it's one of, the, one of the reasons why I think Smith was right. And maybe Rod Smith was correct in saying that the only real way to remedy this is to allow a protection of conscience that encompasses both secular and religious beliefs. That's something I'm certainly happy to support. Um, uh, I don't think we need to trim back the free exercise of religion uh, in, in, in order to uh, also recognize numerous other important freedoms. And I think the courts have been doing that you know, for decades. And, and what they often do is sort of an architecture to freedom. There are certain zones of you know, personal autonomy that are, uh, that are respected. And, and uh, some of what Adele's been talking about is the respect for uh, religious autonomy for uh, that, those sacred spaces where faith communities come together in order to gather. I think the founding fathers would have viewed those spaces as extremely important to society. I think they would have viewed them as, um, uh, as essential to ensuring that an overarching state, an overarching government did not unduly um, you know, invade uh, the province of conscience and of community and of family. And so I think they would have perhaps viewed, um, uh, you know, if they really thought about it, might have viewed Smith um, as being perhaps a little bit simplistic, um, especially as applied to faith communities. And that, that was kind of the hot topic at the time, you know, establishments of religion, churches, and are they going to be able to govern themselves? And I think that at least is one area where they, where they would likely support quite strong um, protections. The law, for the most part, didn't reach those kinds of faith communities. At least uh, there was a, an understanding that it shouldn't uh, after some really bad experiences of trying to regulate uh, churches. But a tough question. The founders, I mean, it, it wasn't even clear they thought this whole thing would, would survive, much less turn into this enormous empire that we now know as the United States of America. So I think they, on one level, they'd be really thrilled that this thing is still going. Um, <clears throat> I don't know when Scott is going to uh, say that we're done, but um, I'm going to ask a question, and that is, um, I think there is some strong sense that we have a very, uh, probably the most pro-religious freedom Supreme Court in since the 1940s now. Um, but at the same time, we have a culture that has um, uh, seems to be much less sympathetic to uh, religious freedom. Uh, do you want to push back on either of, the, of those claims? And uh, what do we do to regain a culture in favor of religious freedom if you agree that we've, we have a culture drifting away? So um, Alexander, I'll well, Alexander, what, I'll start with you and each of you will go Alexander, uh, Bill, Adele. Yeah, it, it is a paradox. A uh, very um, pro-religious freedom Supreme Court uh, and a culture that is moving in the other direction. One of the challenges of of the Smith decision is that it's you know even in the aftermath of Smith, religious exercise has done quite well. Um, but one of the reasons why it has done quite well is because legislatures were quite friendly to religion and they recognized the problem. That era, in many many states, and probably even at the federal government level, is pretty much over. And so we do need a Supreme Court that is willing to step in, it needs to step in carefully. And uh, you know, obviously we can't have rules that overturn um, you know, good management of government and, and the basic norms of society. Um, but we do need a court that is willing to, um, to protect, uh, especially faith communities, places of gathering um, you know, for the faithful. And, uh, and I think people need to come to understand something that Adele has repeatedly spoken about, and that is religious freedom is a matter of human dignity. And we, uh, we use the term human dignity quite a bit in talking about various areas of the law. We need to use it in this area, I think, more often. It is a fundamental matter of who someone is, um, that person's faith, that person's commitment to God. And we need to respect that, even as we are respecting other areas 
uh, that we've come to understand are deeply, deeply vital um, to people's human dignity. Scott, do you want us to end now or can we give Bill the last word? Oh, you're on mute, Scott. Sorry about that. Yes, no, please continue. Uh, uh, let's finish this question. Okay, Bill and then Adele. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I certainly agree with your premise that in some way the uh, new justices seem to be more concerned about religious freedom. Um, but in terms of the culture, I'm not sure we're any religious. We are less tied to a particular majoritarian religion than we used to be. But as a culture, we're not less religious, we're not, we're not, less, we're not uh, or less spiritual than we used to be. We just have different ways of manifesting that spirituality and that beliefs that run across our much wider gamut of religious beliefs. And one of the, one of the interesting things as to why, why the culture has changed around this is that, that people like Scalia, and I think Alexander did this well, weren't really that concerned about minority religions back when he decided Smith because he thought the majoritarian religions would be able to take care of themselves. Uh, with the change of the way the political dynamic is, the majoritarian religions haven't been that, is able to do that as they, as they were. But that just means that getting rid of Smith is just to empower the pre-existing majoritarian religions. Uh, and that's where the focus and the impetus has been rather than protecting um, the minority parts of the religious uh, enterprise earlier. I mean, one of the interesting things about RIFR when it was passed is that you can read the congressional record from top to bottom and nobody is concerned about protecting the rights of Native Americans to ingest peyote. Uh, the concern for that kind of, of religious exercise wasn't there. It was much more of a concern for majoritarian religious exercise. So I'm not sure I buy the second part of the second part of your uh, of your question as much as I might buy the first. I will be quoting you to the people who support the Do No Harm Act now um, and who claimed that RIFRA was only for minority religions, not majority, but thanks Bill for your answer. Um, Adele, you wanna finish this out and then Scott, I'll let you take it. Uh, sure, just a, one of the wonderful, beautiful uh, consequences of RIFRA um, which I, I just, Bill, I, I hesitate to correct you because you lived it and I didn't, um, but, uh, you know, having read some of the hearing transcripts myself and hearing stories of Hmong migrants and the, you know, autopsies that they were seeking to avoid and that RIFRA protected them in that, uh, knowing myself, having researched the, the peyote exemptions, um, uh, that they were enshrined in federal regulations since the 80s. So that may have been one of the reasons that that wasn't top of mind at the federal level, um, because they had federal protection for, for, uh, for at least a decade at that point, and they still do today. Um, but just, you know, just to reframe a little bit, um, you know, Luke Goodrich, my colleague Luke Goodrich, um, and former colleague uh, Rachel Busick did a, a, an empirical study of who's actually being protected under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act today. Um, and since 2014, and they looked at a database of federal court decisions, and they found that um, not only were uh, the majority of decisions, not only did they involve uh, members of minority faith groups, Native Americans, highly represented, but that minority faith groups um, were vastly overrepresented. So in other words, for the one or two or even less percentage points of the American population uh, that minority faith groups represent, uh, they represent a huge plurality of RIFRA decisions. So in other words, RIFRA really is protecting the rights of Native American practitioners uh, using eagle feathers. We are won a case on this issue. Beckett won a case on this issue. Native Americans, members of state recognized tribes seeking to use eagle feathers in their worship in Texas. Uh, Beckett won a case at the Supreme Court for a Muslim inmate in Arkansas State Prison where he was definitely in the minority. Um, you know, so the the uh, the mosques that we have assisted and, and helped with in Tennessee and New Jersey and Illinois and elsewhere, definitely in the minority. RIFRA and the RIFRA standard, whether in RIFRA or, or our LUPA, um, have been a, an enormous uh, source of, of, you almost want to say blessing because we're talking about so many religious people, but an enormous source of freedom for religious adherence. And Bill, I know your heart 
um, is for secular as well as religious conscience. And I just think that is as we protect religious conscience because of the free exercise clause focusing itself in the text of the constitution on religion, we create space in society for dissent and for conscientious objection across the board. We create a form that we respect individual conscience when we respect religious conscience. So I, I hope that this is a rising tide that carries all boats. I certainly, certainly hope that. And I hear your, your concerns on those issues. Alexander, what a pleasure to be on this uh, after so many uh, hearing your, your expert uh, arguments through, uh, through so many court cases. Uh, thank you so much for this time. It's been a great time to learn from both of you. Kim, can I have 20 yeah. seconds? Only, the, only, only to say that, that uh, no, you're right. Uh, certainly, Adele, you're right in terms of the way RIFRA has worked out. What I was saying was that the political motivation uh, came much more from majoritarian religions now because majoritarian religions no longer have, uh, no longer feel that Justice Scalia's legislative way of fixing things would work, re relating back to what Alexander is. But the record you're talking about is absolutely correct. And just briefly, Scott. Uh, Bill, I didn't mean to be so pointed in my saying I would use your words uh, in defending RIFRA uh, because it is, there are bills to try to uh, carve it up. Um, but I do so much appreciate your willingness to be on this panel where you're clearly outnumbered and just how well you've done. And I appreciate that because occasionally I'm on a panel where I'm outnumbered and it's not easy. So thank you so much. And Scott, I'll turn this back over to you. Uh, so thank you, everyone, um, and and uh, just thank you, Adele, for the teaser right there. You didn't know you were doing it, but you were teasing our uh, session tomorrow uh, morning, uh, focusing on the free exercise rights of religious minorities. So if if you found interesting uh, some of the, uh, Adele's comments there, uh, we'll be exploring them in great in greater detail tomorrow morning, including. Uh, a presenter who is an elder uh, in uh, as a Native American elder who uh, has very unique insights uh, on on those matters. And this brings us to the close of another excellent session. I express appreciation to our outstanding speakers uh, and moderator. I regret for many reasons that we are not together in Utah at the moment. Uh, I regret that because I wish we could applaud you audibly. Um, you'll just have to. Accept this time our sincere gratitude.